Hi friends, this is John. Welcome back to the Regenerative Agriculture Podcast. Mostly on this podcast, we focus on solutions. That is not coming from a place of necessarily desiring to avoid the problems or avoid having a conversation about the problems, but simply coming from the place that I believe it's much more powerful to be for something than it is to be against something. About a decade ago, I spent a lot of time studying and talking about the challenges of pesticides in our environment, how they were impacting the soil microbiome, how they were impacting human health. Since then, it's not a conversation that I've had very much or one that I've really spent a lot of time talking about or thinking about because, again, I believe it's more powerful to be focusing on the solutions. Yet in the last couple of years, uh, actually even in the last couple of months, I've had lots of questions of people trying to understand why is glyphosate really a bad deal? So in this conversation, I'm very honored to have Zach Bush here with us today. We will be starting this discussion by describing some of the challenges that really are happening in our agricultural landscapes with the use of pesticides and with glyphosate in particular. And then we do want to also shift the conversation to focusing on the possibilities, the opportunities, the potential to really shift and change and produce a much different outcome. So, Zach, thank you very much for joining us. I've been looking forward to this conversation. I'd love to hear your perspective, really. Let's start with glyphosate and let's start with pesticides. Why is glyphosate damaging? Excellent. Uh, Happy to be on with you, John. You've been a force to be reckoned with in this whole space, uh, bringing great resources, consulting expertise, and uh, real assets uh, in the form of regenerative inputs to to the entire community of of the U.S. and beyond. So thank you uh, for your hard work over the last decades. And my entry into the glyphosate world was very indirect. I, my background as a medical doctor was in uh, chemotherapy development, areas of expertise in endocrinology, metabolism, internal medicine, kind of hospital-based care, as well as outpatient management of hormone disorders. Got in- involved in chemotherapy and cancer research um, as that was where the money was at in academia that could fund my meager t- salary as a academic uh, teacher there. But it was uh, a, an interesting time frame because the world of cancer was changing in that uh, the age old belief that this was a genetic injury and a genetic predisposition was really transforming rapidly in the 2005 kind of time frame where we were starting to get incredible amount of genomic data suggesting that gut microbiome uh, the bacteria and fungi living within us were predicting whether or not cancer would occur. In fact, could they even predict what type of cancers could occur depending on what types of perturbations were in that uh, microbiome ecosystem. And so that was really disruptive to our understanding and status quo of, of cancer research and cancer physiology. And in that journey, I uh, started working with vitamin A compounds and finding that these nutritional elements were having a huge impact on uh, the ability of cancer cells to remove themselves from, from the body. And it's called a process called apoptosis or programmed cell suicide. So it was a very exciting time to realize that maybe there was a future for cancer management where we weren't poisoning tumors, but we're actually giving them nutrients that would increase their capacity for cell cell signaling and and induction of of apoptosis or programmed cell suicide to clean up the cancer independent of the human immune system or other elements of human biology. And so it was really an exciting potential transformative moment. And in that, uh, we saw the big recession happen in 2008 and academia really collapsed. Our, Our division of endocrinologists went from 75 faculty down to about 25 over a very short period of time. And pharmaceutical companies grabbed up most of that talent. Uh, I ended up departing the university at that time and started a nutrition center for reversing chronic disease. And that's how I found my way into this topic of glyphosate that you're asking about. And so from that medical standpoint, I was looking at small chemicals as the solution for many, many years. And when we started working with small compounds made by bacteria and fungi in the soil and the gut, it was alarming to find out that these bacteria and fungi could actually make medicine. They could make things that could repair the human body. And in the end, we found that the biggest uh, thing that they were in opposition to was this chemical glyphosate that you mentioned. And glyphosate is now, you know, recognized worldwide as being kind of a 
flashpoint of controversy with you know a huge multi-billion dollar agricultural system continuing to insist to regulatory bodies around the world that this is a safe compound. Their old catch term was, of course, safer than water. You know, this mentality of this, this can kill weeds, but somehow doesn't kill people was kind of alchemy we couldn't figure out in the soil and plant system. How does a, a plant take these chemicals of herbicides and pesticides that are killing bacteria and fungi and beyond and then suddenly turn them into benign compounds. And the way in which that was justified to the world was through suggesting that the mechanism of glyphosate in regards to its weed killing power was through blocking an enzyme pathway called the shikimate pathway. And the unique thing about this is it doesn't exist in humans. It doesn't exist in any animal out there. And so this was told to us as the rationale for why this chemical could kill plants fungi and bacteria, but wouldn't hurt uh, your livestock or your pet or your children uh, was because we didn't have this enzyme pathway that was its target. And so that was how I think it was justified through the system. But what we weren't recognizing by that very story was that glyphosate was blocking an enzyme pathway, the shikimate pathway, that was crucial to the health of humanity and animal life that's consuming the plants that have been treated with this chemical. And what it's doing is undermining the ability of, for bacteria, fungi, and plants to produce the aromatic amino acids. These are a portion of the essential amino acids. Uh, recall that there's 22 amino acids uh, that build the human body. And of those 22, there are nine that we call essential amino acids that cannot be manufactured by the human body because we lack the enzyme pathways. And some of those uh, nine are represented in these uh, essential amino acids made through the shikimate pathway. If Monsanto was right, this was the only way that this toxin worked. Perhaps there wasn't a direct target towards human health if that was the limitation of its effect. But there was certainly an indirect effect that would occur if we started growing all of our food under the pressure of a chemical that blocked the ability of that food to make the essential protein building blocks that our body can't produce. And so that was the beginning of a real destructive quality to this thing as it undermined the building blocks for proteins across all biology and certainly kills weeds quickly for eliminating those essential amino acids. And subsequently, we start to develop deficiencies as human beings in essential amino acids produced by the microbiome of the soils and ultimately a reduction in our microbiome as just like it does in soil, the residues of glyphosate in our food and water systems are now ingested and killing acting as an antibiotic uh, to the microbiome of our gut. And so we become deficient there. And so we are really undermining the health of soils and gut performance in humans, animals, and you know all the way down to the earthworm uh, with this disruption of an antibiotic that's now infused into our system. You've described this indirect effect of glyphosate limiting the synthesis of these essential amino acids that we require and that animals require. How does glyphosate impact our bodies directly, if at all? Yeah, so this is what was not told to us by the chemical companies, but our laboratory has been working on it for the last eight years is to what is the direct consequences of Roundup in, in the human biology. And it turns out it very rapidly uh, destroys protein structure in the extracellular matrix as well as in the intracellular system. And that has huge consequences for everything from you know the way in which cells feed themselves, the metabolism of fuel, all the way down to detoxification and repair and regeneration systems within the cell, specifically the mitochondria within those cells, which are like little bacteria that are capable of producing energy for the human cell. Those are also influenced by the toxicity of this antimicrobial. And so the mitochondria within us and the bacteria and fungi that support human cellular life throughout the, the whole organ system of the body is now recognized to be a direct target for glyphosate. And so when it starts to denature the proteins in your gut lining, for example, you start to develop a leak. And the proteins function sort of like Velcro, holding one epithelial cell, boundary cell to the next to create this huge gut barrier. Uh, that, that is the largest surface area that exposes you to the outside world. It's two tennis courts in the surface area. And that gut lining made up of billions of epithelial cells that are smaller than about half the width of a human hair. And those uh, little guys uh, now bound together in billions will, will cover those two tennis courts in surface area. And it's the Velcro that holds them into that coherent system. 
when the Velcro is damaged directly by glyphosate, we see leak start to develop across the system. And once you're starting that gut leak, you're now overwhelming the immune system with every glass of water or bite of food you eat, not only with the chemicals and the heavy metals and other things that are infused into much of our food system today, but also the organic compounds such as, you know, insoluble fiber of kale, which should be one of the you know best anti-cancer compounds in the body, can actually become an inflammatory natus if it sneaks through that gut lining uh, inappropriately. And so that leaky gut becomes the source for chronic inflammation. And now if you've been keeping up with the human health literature, it's very hard to find one of our chronic diseases that's gone epidemic over the years, whether we're talking about autism and asthma and allergies in children or Alzheimer's, Parkinson's and cancer in adults. The whole spectrum has now been mapped back to disruption of the gut and chronic inflammation pursuing. So uh, we see glyphosate now as really the gatekeeper event or this you know slippery slope into this chronic inflammatory state within the body. And we can show this on very detailed population maps that the higher the concentrations of glyphosate in your environment, the more likely you are to have immune dysfunction and chronic disease right, in the population they're in ultimately high cancer rates. In the United States, we see that best exemplified in the Mississippi River, which collects about 80, 85% of the water soluble residues of Roundup and uh, the last 90 miles of that Mississippi River running between Baton Rouge and New Orleans, Louisiana is called Cancer Alley, highest rates of cancer in the entire developed world. So uh, really terrifying quality to this disruptive nature of not just destroying the microbiome and its support, but then destroying the self-identity of the human or animal in that it loses that boundary event, what's inside, what's outside, and the like. You mentioned glyphosate as an antibiotic and the impact that it has on the microbiome. We know that it's patented as an antibiotic, of course. What are the concentrations that are required to have this effect on our microbiome? Yeah, the, the concentrations can be quite small. So you're down in the two parts per billion to five parts per billion levels. Uh, and this is a, what you would typically see in, in a lot of water systems around the country and the like. At a thousand fold that concentration, you're up in the two parts per million to 20 parts per million. That's what you're commonly seeing on root vegetables and other conventionally grown crops out there. And, you know, beets can be as high as 20 parts per million uh, in the grocery store. And so you're a thousand fold the detectable level of damage once you're at the grocery store. If you get into uh, livestock feed and pet food, you're now often in the 400 parts per million or even 1,000 parts per million of glyphosate. And so you're up many 100,000 times that of its lowest threshold for damage. And so uh, certainly functioning as an antibiotic, uh, it, it doesn't take much to disrupt the ecosystem balance. Functioning as a disruptor of protein structures, you're down in that conventional vegetable range is plenty to create that leaky membrane effect. The focus for the last few years has really been on glyphosate as a molecule, but I think we also need to ask the question, what about the adjuvants that it is associated with, and not just the adjuvants that glyphosate is associated with, but the broad array of other pesticides that are routinely used in agricultural ecosystems. Why is glyphosate being singled out? Is glyphosate so much worse than other pesticides? How is it different from others that are in the environment? I think that's an important question because it's in this 30-year journey with Roundup and glyphosate, I think we've really had to come to terms with the fact that we were judging toxicity by a very narrow definition. And so Roundup came on the scene in the mid-1970s to replace chemicals like atrazine that were known carcinogens, very damaging to respiratory systems. There was a sense of, oh, this is the newer, safer compound And so regulatory communities around the world raced to get this thing approved because it worked so effectively and was so much less toxic in our current understanding of that word. The reason why atrazine looks more toxic is because it can do direct cellular damage to membranes. It can do direct damage to DNA and all of that kind of stuff. So it kind of fits our more classic model of cancer and carcinogenic features to it. In contrast, in the 1970s, we had no idea that the microbiome was actually at the real foundation of cancer. We thought it was direct DNA damage that was doing cancer risk. And so we didn't understand at the time that we were really undermining biologic life by switching from an atrazine direct toxin to this indirect antimicrobial disruptor of you know amino acid building blocks and all these kind of 
long-term indirect features that we wouldn't really discover until a generation into the journey. And generation is measured by about 23, 25 years. And so by uh, 25 years in that journey, we're hitting year 2000. And we suddenly realized that we were in an epidemic of autoimmune disease that had really kicked up by 1996, 98. Uh, we were in an epidemic of neurologic disorder in children with a huge rise in autism, attention deficit, hyperactivity disorders, sleeping disorders, mood disorders in children, anxiety and, and depression disorders. You know, the whole gamut uh, was going crazy by that one generation in. And we now know from generational mouse studies that there is a cumulative epigenetic effect to this injury, meaning that if you injure generation one, uh, with a small amount of Roundup injected under the skin, just a little pocket of it, there's no measurable damage to that mouse. They go on to have normal pups. They go on to have a normal lifespan. However, Generation 2, not exposed to Roundup, but came from mom who was exposed to Roundup, has significant issues with metabolic disorders, uh, immune dysfunction, and has shortened lifespan. The third generation, again, not exposed directly, but indirectly to grandma now, uh, that indirect grandmother epigenetic pattern is now manifesting cancers and stillbirths in that third generation. So there's this really terrifying cumulative effect that happens generationally from uh, this exposure to Roundup. And so I'm, I'm very concerned that we're heading into the third generation of children under Roundup just in the next five years. And so in the next five years, I think we're going to see the real epidemic declare itself in its full potential. Uh, as we move from 2025 to 2035. And currently, uh, we're already in an exponential growth of these chronic conditions in children. We've gone from an average of 1.5% of children with a chronic disease in the 1960s before the advent of Roundup to uh, our current situation where 52% of children in the United States screened by Medicaid surveys are now with a chronic disease. And so we have this, you know, devastating impact on human health in what is, you know, certainly the most advanced and most expensive medical system in the world. We are not succeeding in preventing this level of disease within our children. We're literally building entire cities, Texas Children's Hospital in Houston. Good example of this is, you know, skyscrapers uh, on skyscrapers on skyscrapers, you know, literally tower after tower after tower of uh, children's hospital housing our kids with cancer and severe autoimmune diseases and all these horrible conditions. And so if we're building cities to house our sick children and not getting at the realization of what we've done, we've got a real state of denial. And unfortunately, that's, that's very much what I think we have at the regulatory level. You've made the comment that we're on track to go extinct as a species in the next 70 years. What was the basis for that comment? Was it additional factors other than just glyphosate or specifically glyphosate? I would say glyphosate is public enemy number one in that it's you know been our widest spread antibiotic on the planet. We now know that human life is dependent upon a diverse microbiome ecosystem of fungi and bacteria, parasites, protozoa, the whole spectrum. We, we need all of those guys for healthy soil, healthy plants, healthy life. And we've undermined that with this most ubiquitous of chemicals now. We're, we're somewhere around you know, 4 billion uh, pounds of this chemical used worldwide every year now. The uh, amount used globally has roughly doubled every six years uh, for the last 35 years. And so we've had this explosive and constant rise in this antimicrobial pressure that has devastated the health of our livestock, has devastated the health of our children, and has certainly devastated the, the health of the planet. The 70-year estimate is actually very specific, not just to uh, the rise of chronic disease, um, which, you know, to give a sense of it, you know, where we're heading for 2035 right now is that one in three children in the United States will have an autism spectrum disorder. And so if you start to then map that forward, you know, what is the productivity of that, that generation that has one in three children on the spectrum? What is the cost of care to that generation? Uh, what is the lost productivity of their parents and grandparents and aunts and uncles that are trying to contribute to daycare and you know in-home care and and the cost of institutional care? It just starts to you realize even with that one condition, we could completely destroy the economy of the United States through just healthcare costs. Then you add in eighty percent of adults with cancer by twenty thirty five, and you realize we've got a completely insoluble state of health. All of that said, that's not really how you map out the prediction of extinction. For extinction, you need to undermine fertility, and that's what we've done simultaneously. So since the advent of 
glyphosate. And again, as you've said, there's many different chemicals and radiation exposures, cell phones, cell phone towers, uh, as well as, you know, Bluetooth devices and this coming 5G era and everything else. Like there's certainly many, many things that are disrupting biologic function. And so we can look at that as a cohesive toxic stew, if you will, and then look at how its impact on fertility. And in the United States and other Western countries, we've seen a decline between 52% and 57% in sperm counts in males over that period of time, so since the mid-1970s. And so with a 52 to 57% decline in sperm counts, we now have one in three males in Western countries that are infertile uh, due to an, a lack of production of sperm. That's an extraordinary statistic, one in three males now infertile. And then you look across to the female biology and you find that it's nearly the identical number. You've got one in four women that are affected with just the condition of polycystic ovarian syndrome. And then you have a whole host of other conditions that contribute to the additional women to reach this kind of one in three with infertile or, or poor fertility state. And so those are the numbers that as you extrapolate them out with the rising curves of toxicity in the soils and more importantly, perhaps for our survival, the toxicity of our oceans and water systems, you start to realize we've got about eight years before we tip off uh, to a crisis level of biology within water and, and soil systems and uh, expect an acceleration in, in this already extraordinary decline in, in fertility. And so the extinction event will happen through an acceleration of chronic disease coupled with this total loss of fertility within the species. And that's not specific to humans, obviously. We've seen 50% of life uh, wiped off the face of the planet in the last 40 or 50 years. And so uh, there's been many books written on this and everything else. We're in the midst of the sixth great extinction on planet right now. And this time, this is from the cataclysmic event that we call a human. L other cataclysmic events that have caused widespread death of species across the world have always tied back to soil and water uh, destruction. Typically, it's an asteroid that covers the earth with a layer of dust, disrupts the respiratory system of the planet. You end up with CO2 accumulation in the atmosphere, you acidify the oceans, and then you get widespread 87 to 97% wipeout of life on earth. That's happened five previous times. And so the sixth time, we're now the, the great destructive force that's destroying our soil systems, causing the accumulation of CO2, methane, and other carbon substrates into the atmosphere, which are then acidifying the oceans through the same process. And so we've seen this cycle many times. And so mapping out an extinction event doesn't have to be theoretical. We, we have a lot of data in the, in the fossil record and a lot of data around what's currently happening over the last 40 years to understand how we're undermining and how this rolls out over the next few decades. Zach, what resources can you recommend for people who want to learn more? There's obviously resources about the extinction events that you've been describing in the fossil record and so forth, but specifically to this human causation, the impact of pesticides, autism, cancer, rising medical costs, infertility, etc. Has this information been organized and pulled together into one coherent and easy to read analysis anywhere? Uh, I hope not, because that's the book I'm writing right now. But <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, in, uh, honestly, there's a ton of great books out there that you know touch on this from different perspectives. I think the work that was done with the two books, uh, one is called uh, Sapiens, and then the follow-up was called Homo Deus. Those two books, uh, I think, really give a, a really interesting look at the history of where we've been as a species and where we're heading as a species in regards to our own extinction. Those books do not have any reference to the agricultural chemicals, as we've been talking here, but a good understanding of where we stand in the history of mankind and the planet as a whole. In regards to the reading for specific injury of glyphosate on human systems, I think Stephanie Seneff has done some of the best work in the country in publishing a lot of peer-reviewed papers on the topic. Um, she's uh, a computer scientist out of MIT. She actually was the director of AI at MIT in, in the 1980s and 90s, uh, incredibly brilliant woman. And by 1998, she was starting to pick up mathematical patterns in the epidemics of chronic disease that were pointing to some drastic change in the environment. And uh, she was the first one to really identify glyphosate as that smoking gun to accelerate all of this uh, that we've been talking about. So SENEF is S-E-N-N-E-F there. And Stephanie's uh, got a great spectrum of papers out there if you want to dive deeper into that. One of the criticisms that I've heard about Stephanie's work and about this general 
conversation of implicating glyphosate in particular and agricultural chemicals in general is the whole conversation about correlation versus causation. What is your response to correlation versus causation? Super important. Yeah, no, that's exactly super important. So uh, that's what our lab has brought in over the last uh, you know seven years is really the causation piece. Uh, she's been doing phenomenal work understanding the theoretical models as to how glyphosate is dru- disrupting protein structures and all of that. But our lab is the first to really identify how that's being done and, and where in the body is that protein disruption happening, uh, specifically around the gut lining and the like. We've also shown gut brain injury with the blood brain barrier directly damaged by these systems as well. So uh, we've got a bunch of white papers and peer reviewed science that can be found on ionbiome.com, I-O-N-B-I-O-M-E, ionbiome.com. Thanks for sharing those references. Can you give us a verbal overview in addition to those papers? Can you give us a, a verbal overview of the work that you've done in your lab and what you've been learning and discovering? Yeah, so uh, our first work was done um, looking at the direct influence of glyphosate on those boundaries of the tight junctions, as they're referred to. Tight junctions are those Velcro-like proteins. Complex structures, they, there's about 13 different proteins that are involved in a tight junction anchoring, anchoring one cell to the next, and they act as intelligent gatekeepers. So they actually allow, allow macromolecules, things like soluble fiber and other large carbohydrates to cross between the the epithelial boundary so that they don't have to be transported through the cell. So it's an intelligent gatekeeper system. And we were the first lab to show the direct effects of glyphosate disrupting that Velcro. And we've also shown in those that there's a a phenotypic change or or a change in the characteristics of those cells once they fall apart. Uh, They've quickly moved to uh, kind of a precancerous state. They appear uh, much smaller than they were in the healthy state just moments before they broke apart. They have a, a characteristic shrinkage of the cytoplasm or fluid within the cell. And that's one of the hallmarks of kind of a precancer cancer cells. Then we see a drop in their capacity to make uh, reactive oxygen species or, or stress signaling. And then we've uh, shown that you're losing that kind of mitochondrial potential uh, at the same time that you're losing that boundary event. We've uh, gone on to uh, show that there's synergy between gluten injury at that gut lining and glyphosate, demonstrating that uh, we really didn't have gluten sensitivity in any uh, significant amount in the population until 1992 when we started spraying wheat directly with glyphosate. And we've shown the mechanism by which glyphosate and gluten synergistically disrupt that tight junction. Um, And so that uh, paper is out there, one of our first publications there, and that synergy between gluten and glyphosate to induce gluten sensitivity. Uh, Many people who've experienced gluten sensitivity or friends that do, almost everybody's now one degree of separation from somebody who's got gluten sensitivity, uh, will find that if they go over to Europe or another environment where there's uh, no use of glyphosate in the wheat systems, uh, you don't see the same uh, symptoms that are associated with what we call gluten sensitivity conclusion of that is really that we, do, we don't really have gluten sensitivity, we have glyphosate toxicity. And when you have glyphosate toxicity, then things like gluten, and even in our clinic, we found even things like kale can become pro-inflammatory and cause bloating and, and pain and inflammation signals and, and symptoms in human patients that have that leaky gut injury. And so that has been an interesting look at how, you know, healthy grains and foods that have been in the diet for thousands of years can suddenly become noxious to us. And in the same way, you can see the, the effects of children who are now allergic to so many foods and systems. So it used to be when I was growing up, there was one kid in our entire school of 800 kids that had a peanut allergy. And so there was one EpiPen and the nurse's thing with, it, with his name on it. Now, if you go into a nurse's office, you've got many dozens of EpiPens with different, you know, allergies from everything from pollen to dust mites to cat dander and everything else, all the way down to the foods of avocados and eggs and seeds and all kinds of things that they're deathly allergic to now. And so as we see that erosion of that, we we see the rise of that immune dysfunction there. So that's all tied up in that causation effect that you're inquiring about. I'm very excited to see Stephanie's work of 30 years start to really be supported by these causation studies to show that she was indeed right in her modeling. It is remarkable when you stop to think about the idea, the phrase of food allergy put together as a common phrase. 
it should give us pause to stop and ask the question, why would people be allergic to food? Why should people be allergic to food? They should not, of course. Exactly. And I am always dumbfounded by my own career. Like, we are not taught to ask those questions as physicians. It's so bizarre. Like, and deeper than the question of why are kids allergic to food, the next or more extreme version of that is why are children unable to breathe? And and we've got one in eight children with asthma in the United States, Australia, UK. Um, and so it, one in eight children can't breathe. You've got one in four children that can't eat or, or breathe without having an allergic reaction. It, it's just a, a totally astounding demonstration of, of the, the extreme disruption that we've done to human biology such that we can't even live on planet Earth anymore without immune dysfunction and, and rapid aging. And so we are really seeing the destruction of a planet. I think back to those science fiction Star Trek episodes that I would catch at a friend's house when I was a kid or something. And it was like mind blowing to see these, think about these other planets and exploring the solar systems and seeing planets that could or could not support life. And some had oxygen, some didn't, some had water, some didn't, you know, this, this concept, well, we're about to create a planet that doesn't have water or soil systems that support biologic life and hum human existence. And so we really are creating a, a Martian landscape uh, that, that's inhospitable to our own species as we continue to destroy the ecosystem around us. Our biggest agricultural export is topsoil, seven, to the tune of 75 billion tons per year. And that is, it gives us, I think, recall the math correctly, that gives us in the remaining 60 cropping years until the topsoil will be completely gone. Yep, you're exactly right on that. And that 60 years was an astounding number because I, I just heard that only like three or four years ago from Alan Williams, was blown away by that statistic because it mapped so darn close to the human expiration date of 70 years, you know, and it just really drew a fine point on the reality that we're not talking about some theoretical human extinction. We're talking about the lack of capacity for the planet to make life happen. And the topsoil is absolutely where that has to occur. That is ground zero, no pun intended, or maybe pun intended. That is ground zero of our survival state. If we cannot regenerate soils, if we cannot reverse the cycle of soil loss, we do not have life on earth. It's not just the bees that are going extinct. It's not just the humans. There will be a complete loss of multicellular organisms, mammals, etc. as we go down that path. I think the exciting aspect of what you just said that, you know, our, our lar largest loss you know, or export, if you will, uh, in this country is that massive soil de devastation. We're losing somewhere around two tons of topsoil per acre per, you know, 125 million acres uh, of farmland in the United States right now. If you add that, the cost of that resource up, you're looking at about 11% of our gross domestic product every year being flushed down rivers and into oceans to choke out coral reefs and destroy ecosystems in those spaces, 11% of our GDP lost in, in soil resources every year. And so the reason why I get excited about that number is that's real to politicians, that's real to economists and, and economy forecasters, it's real to the fundamental consumer product industry that's relying on production of those soils to, to fuel their plastics industry or their fuel industry. Uh, our commodities crops are by and large not going into food anymore. They're, they're going towards these oil-based products uh, like apparel and hospital equipment and packaging for consumer goods and all of this. If we start to show this direct fiscal financial loss, I think that it's a different avenue into the minds of the powers to be around money management in this country. And I think we're seeing an adjustment. I think we're seeing an enormous explosion of interest in uh, impact investment funds and regenerative agriculture and, and regen you know, supply systems and everything else. And certainly this, this whole pandemic that we've just been through has put a very fine point on it. We've lost hundreds of millions of jobs worldwide. We've pushed an estimated 125 million households into financial crisis with another 125 million uh, households joining them within the next four weeks if we don't get things going, which it looks like we won't. And so 250 million households being pressed into crisis financially and having a sense also of the fragile you know, supply chain of the current you know, mega industry approach to 
food systems. And so I'm, I'm very excited to see these kind of fiscal numbers rather than just a biologic concept be put on this. I think it's more palatable and feels more real to a lot of the decision makers in our economy. We've been focusing our conversation so far on the challenges of glyphosate, but one of the pieces that really got me started down this pathway over a decade ago was the realization that the majority of ag pesticides that are used and sprayed on our landscape are significant endocrine disruptors. In fact, many of the uh, insecticides and so forth function as endocrine disruptors. And the implications of what that means for our own endocrine system and the very infinitesimally small quantities that are required to be significant disruptors. Could you offer your perspective and share your perspective on what it means for our bodies to be disrupted by endocrine disruptors and what is really required and the impact that ag pesticides can have in that context? Yeah, uh, it's an interesting uh, reality because uh, once you open up that gut lining with, with glyphosate, you now are opening the path for innumerable chemicals and toxins to come in after it. And, you know, some of the most ubiquitous of those is actually the plastics and, and uh, long chain petroleum products that we see in uh, chemical agriculture and the like, you know, our fertilizer systems. And so as we develop these small and, and long chain molecule you know, resources for our agricultural system, as well as our consumer packaged goods and all the other ways we use plastics, uh, and then you add Roundup to the system, you've opened up the, the gate, if you will, and all of those go pouring into the human system. The endocrine system is a, a really elaborate system of feedback loops and communication networks uh, within the body that coordinate the behavior of some 70 trillion human cells and then figure out their relationship and response to around 1.4 quadrillion bacteria, 14 quadrillion mitochondria, you know, the numbers are just absolutely staggering in the symphony that happens in a healthy biologic system. And as you introduce these endocrine disruptors of plastics and small chemical uh, molecules from the agricultural system, uh, you start to plug up all sorts of uh, these cycles of communication and you gum up the, the mechanisms of metabolism or fuel production. And so one of the first steps that we see is fatty liver. Uh, fatty liver is one of the, the most established side effects of glyphosate in our food and water systems. It's now the leading cause of hepatitis in the country is fatty liver from nutritional sources rather than from viral sources as seen in the past with hepatitis C and the like. Over the last 10 years, we've seen uh, you know, nutritional sources of, of these endocrine disruptors become the, the leading cause of liver failure. Uh, we've seen uh, chronic kidney disease rise in the world to be the number one chronic disease uh, represented globally right now. And that, again, is uh, through the disruption of, of the tight junction protein structure that we see with glyphosate disruption of the kidneys. Uh, but it's also caused by a disruption in this incredibly eloquent hormonal communication network between human bone, bloodstream, fat cells, and kidneys and how they our, our channel to do detoxification for us and uh, improve uh, resource management. All of that gets disrupted and we start to leak like a sieve at the kidney level. And so with the, this endocrine disruption, you start to undermine the way nutrients are delivered through the liver and how toxins are cleared through the kidneys and how resources are reclaimed by the kidneys to make sure we're maintaining our resource reservoirs appropriately. Protein is a good example. As the kidney damage happens through glyphosate, plus the endocrine disruption effects, you start to dump protein into the urine at a very high level. And so you're losing you know, the most important asset that the body has, which are the, the amino acid and protein structures that it's worked so hard to build. And so uh, the endocrine disruption really can't be under you know, estimated in its effect. It's certainly underpinning this whole drop in testosterone, drop in sperm counts, drop in fertility in women with uh, the dysregulation of insulin and the ovary with estrogen production, all of this leading to polycystic ovarian syndrome, failure to ovulate, failure for fertility, all of this tying back. The amount of this disruption has gotten so severe that we can just look at a single condition like hypothyroidism or autoimmune thyroiditis uh, that's common in women more than men. But we see it at now in universal screening even as early as 2005 we were seeing uh, one in four women or one in four girls at age 12 with uh, autoantibodies to our own thyroid. And so uh, that's kind of the level of endocrine dysfunction where our own endocrine system is being destroyed by our immune system 
uh, as that you know, gut barrier and, and that self-identity is eroded by glyphosate and all of these endocrine disruptors come flowing in behind to disrupt the, the nuances of that endocrine system. We see chronic fatigue syndromes. We see chronic pain syndromes. We see uh, hyperactivity in neurologic conditions in kids. We see neurologic degenerative conditions like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, ALS, MS, all going up in their epidemic numbers over the last decade and a half or two. And so it's it's just staggering, uh, you know, how many uh, systems have been disrupted through this kind of universal poisoning of the, of the agriculture system. Zach, through this conversation, you've right off the top of your head mentioned a lot of staggering statistics, quite frankly, staggering about the degrading health condition of the population at large. How does the overall health condition of the agricultural community compare to the population at large? Yeah, it's you know a sad reality that our farmers are really on the front lines of this toxicity, obviously. And it was just numbers for me until I started to shoot the documentary film for our nonprofit, Farmers Footprint. Um, we started in Minnesota and took a two-week road trip all the way down the tributary pathway of the Mississippi River that ends in, in New Orleans. And that two-week journey, we, we were sat in innumerable living rooms of farmers and uh, sat with families, children, etc. And you couldn't find a family that was growing conventional agriculture that wasn't directly being affected by this toxicity. Children with ADHD, children with frank disorders of birth defects. We saw children born on farms that had failed to form their brain correctly with the connection between left and right hemisphere, a very rare disorder. And to see a couple of those in a single road trip um, was a big warning that, oh my gosh, we've got this massive amount of dysfunction at the fetal development level in these uh, toxic environments of the agricultural system. The adults had a huge amount of major depression. Suicide has been steadily rising as uh, mood disorders are now linked to gut health and the destruction of the microbiome from the likes of glyphosate, disrupting the amount of serotonin and dopamine that the brain is able to receive from the gut. 90% of the serotonin is made in the gut lining, 50% of the dopamine made in the gut lining. And so as you destroy that gut lining with glyphosate, you're losing that infrastructure. And, and we see that really potent in the farmers that are out there mixing uh, up their stews of chemicals to treat their weed systems and all that, their herbicide and pesticide mixes that they now have to do because Roundup has lost its efficacy as a single chemical. Now that we have so much Roundup resistant weeds, it's a mixture typically of 2,4-D or atrazine and glyphosate and nicotinamides and a, a whole stew of mess. And those farmers are now wiping out their gut lining and they're attributing their depression and suicide to financial stress when in fact, I believe that financial stress is as old as farming itself. When it comes to agriculture, it's never been an easy business. It's always been at the mercy of uh, environmental changes and environmental crises and collapses and uh, natural disasters and changes in economies and markets and everything else. And so never have we seen the suicide rates that we do today. And I don't think it can be just blamed on financial stress. I think it's a direct effect of these chemicals on our blood-brain barrier, on our gut barrier, on the manufacturing capacity of neurotransmitters at the gut lining. So suicide is now rampant. We see um, many of the farmers uh, that we've filmed and talked to uh, with their second and third cancers. There's Cancer Alley down in New Orleans. Once you get down that far, it's not unusual to find farmers that have been diagnosed and treated for cancer five times uh, over the last 15 years. And so it's just like this devastating disease capacity. And when you walk into their kitchens, you realize that they are starving of nutrients. Uh, they are literally eating frozen pizzas uh, that have been prepared in China or some other far-flung place of the world and shipped and, and sold at ridiculously low prices of $1.99 for a Totino's pizza or something like that. And that's dinner for a farm that owns 3,000 acres and spends their entire livelihood growing thousands of acres of supposed food crop, and they are starving with a lack of nutrients in the home. 
And so you can see this just food desert effect. Kansas is our most agricultural uh, state in the union. And I've pointed to this many times because I think it's one of the most profound things I've heard from the farmers so far. Uh, But at Fuller Farms, I think it was maybe two years ago now, or maybe just last year, the Fuller Farms event, a great presentation was demonstrated that Kansas, uh, where we were having the the event, is covered in 90% agricultural uh, system by land volume. And the uh, the state has to import 90% of its food. And one in four children is going hungry each night in Kansas for a lack of nutrients and calories. So uh, really devastating look at just how we aren't feeding the world with this chemical agriculture, as we were told. We aren't even feeding ourselves with this thing anymore. And as we mentioned earlier, much of those commodity crops are now going into either feed for cattle and, and poultry and swine, or they're going into the ethanol for the fuel industry, or they're going into the small molecule production for the processed food industry, like high fructose corn syrup and the like, or uh, small molecule oil products to go into health and apparel and the rest. So uh, we're starving our own systems through there. So that the health and the nutrition status of these home throughout the Midwest is devastating. And now that we've been started to travel the world with our nonprofit, we find the same phenomenon in Australia, we've, in Hawaii, certainly South America, uh, suffering from widespread hunger still. Uh, really devastating reality for farmers today in so many sectors. The agribusiness marketing mantra of needing to feed the world has certainly become very popular in the farming community. And Uh, I've made the comment as well. It's not a popular comment to make at a farm meeting in the Midwest, but the Midwest really is a good food desert. It's hard to find. If you're traveling and you want to stay at a hotel, the typical hotel in the Midwest, the the quality of food that is served at a continental breakfast that is considered to be food is not fit for human consumption, quite frankly. I completely agree. Yeah. And it was so interesting too. Like we, uh, when we were up in Minnesota, we were um, like our third night into this two week road trip, we were all starting to feel sick. Like we were all just feeling wiped out and starting to feel depressed. And uh, frankly, we were starting to fall asleep in the middle of conversations and stuff like that, just with incredible fatigue in our whole group. And uh, we went, went to the front desk uh, trying to find some dinner asking, you know, is there any health food places around? And these two young women at the desk looked at each other like we had asked if there were elephants around or something like they didn't even know what those two words meant next to each other, health food. And so they said, well, there's three restaurants. And so they told us about the three restaurants we could drive to. And we went to the one that was you know, right on the river. They said, it's got good, good fish or something, they said. So we went there. All, most of our team not even eating fish were plant-based people. And we show up there and it is the grossest looking, you know, salad bar you've ever seen in your life. Everything's fried. Everything's been you know, obliterated from any nutrient connection back to mother nature. And so you're absolutely right that not only is there a food desert, I think there's a, a memory deficit of what life would look like if there was real food around. What did these farms look like in the 1950s? Well, they all had backyard gardens that were booming and they were feeding themselves out of their own gardens And then they would sell the crops from the rest of the acreage, but they were always feeding themselves. And so somewhere between 1945 and 1975, we forced these farmers to grow their operations and shrink their workforce to eke out ever more profit for the middlemen and distributors and everything else, such that these farmers didn't have time or energy left to grow their own food in their backyards. Uh, It was only a couple of the farms that were starting to make the transition back to regen that we found growing their own food in any significant portion. And that's, you know, I think really telling. And and I don't blame these farmers for that at all, because the reality is, as a farmer, as anybody's listening to this show, it probably is. You guys are are faced with a situation that um, if you take inflation into consideration, the amount of profit or cents on the dollar that's coming back. So for every consumer dollar spent on food, I think you're now down to about 14 cents returning to the farmer. For the uh, farmer in the 1960s, that number was around 60 cents on the dollar. So 60 cents on the dollar going directly back to the farmer in the 1960s. Now it's 14 cents for the farmer today. And then if you take in inflation, that's actually a 96% reduction in your uh, livelihood or the, the amount of money coming from consumer back to farmer over that period of time. 
that's why farms have had to grow so large ultimately is not just because the, these farmers want to get rich. They have to grow 10 times more crop if they're going to make it at 14 cents on the dollar. Uh, and so it's really the economics of all of the you know, subsidization and false economies of banks loaning out money for inputs and then the banks getting back an interest on all of that. And then you've got distributors that have become these, you know, almost monopoly like juggernauts between you and the customer. All of this is built in an insoluble system that has forced farmers into a state of exhaustion that has just uh, really rarely been seen in history, if ever. To add to your earlier comments, it's easy for us to forget that the agricultural landscape actually looked significantly different not that long ago in history. Today, we have the significant majority of apple production all concentrated in the state of Washington, for example. And there's other regions of the country, New York and Michigan contribute some as well in other parts of the country. But not so very long ago, if I recall correctly, it was 1949. Prior to 1949, the state of Iowa was the sixth in the nation in apple production. And there was large-scale flax production, a lot of uh, what could be considered more specialty crops. And today in the state of Iowa, anything that's not corn and not soybeans is considered a specialty crop. So the agricultural landscape has shifted, as you pointed out, for a whole variety, a whole range of different reasons and influences. But I want to come back. Uh, We've talked about the challenges of glyphosate and pesticides and the health epidemic or the sickness epidemic that is occurring in the countryside and across the country The obvious question that needs to be asked is, how can people in rural areas protect themselves? Yeah, I think it really begins in your soil, and it's such a fast recovery. I find it phenomenal. You know, for all the bad news that we've shared on on this podcast, I think the silver lining here, in fact, the, you know, the bright light at the end of this tunnel of destruction that we've experienced as an agricultural system is this regenerative movement. I am just dumbfounded by the speed at which the recovery happens, not just for the soil, but the health and vitality of families. And so, you know, Don and Grant and Bright Roots that uh, were featured in our first uh, Farmer's Footprint documentary, they are a great example of just the vitality that they've been bringing back into their environment. Uh, Since making the transition to a regenerative system. They've certainly grown their farm. They've got a lot more acreage under under farming now. They were kind of at a financial crisis point before making the transition. Farm was overrun with Roundup resistant weeds that were shutting down equipment and all kinds of things uh, falling apart. And as they've made this steady increase to a regenerative system, they've just seen an explosion in their progress. And not only has that been good for business on the farm, it's inspired their daughter to return to the farm with her family and create a direct-to-consumer marketplace for their grass-raised beef that's participating in the regeneration of the soils of their land they run and all of this. And so seeing a multi-generational farm start to, to reclaim its potential there is really thrilling. And uh, that farm had been in the family, I believe, for uh, their, in the fourth generation, I believe, there with Grant's current management. And and so to see this you know, fourth or fifth generation coming on with their children is just phenomenally exciting that that potential is there. And if you go out to any commodities you know, growing farm right now, one of their primary concerns is succession plans. There are not enough children wanting to stay in those environments to fight out a, an ever, ever smaller uh, margin of success with ever more effort and more toxic lifestyle. Uh, and more lonely lifestyle that's that's happening in these mega farm environments. And so uh, regenerative agriculture is so interesting in that it solves so many levels of the crisis that we're in. Uh, one of the neat ones is reconnection to community. Going to a regen conference is like going to a massive family reunion where there's just so much joy and everybody is, is talking about I mean, what they've seen fixed on their land as Mother Nature's taken back over, what species they're now seeing and cover crops coming up, what species of, of ancient, uh, you know, prairie grass is starting to grow on their land again, and, and what types of species of birds are back in. Like, that's what I hear in the halls of, of regen agriculture. If you go to your conventional agricultural system, everybody's talking about their bushels of soybeans and how many per acre and, you know, what are their best inputs and, uh, you know, what's, what's the new uh, farm subsidy that's best to go after? How much sugar beet should you plant so you get the maximum s- subsidies? You know, it's just an opposite conversation that really speaks to 
not just the health of the human beings in that environment, the health and vitality of economics, ecology, all of it is it's just beautiful ripples of, of generative, regenerative, life-giving uh, on every level kind of effects. Zach, I want to get into the conversation more deeply about agriculture and agronomy, but I want to go back to the question that I asked you in the context of personal human health. How can people in rural areas protect themselves? How can our listeners where can they go to learn more on how to protect their own health and how to regenerate their own body's microbiome, if you will, to overcome the challenges that are being inflicted upon them by their environment? Yeah, those are great questions. And, you know, the answers are challenging in the backyard, but they are there. So, you know, starting to grow your own food is your, your best first step, I think. And so getting reconnected to the soil and your own nutrition system is going to be one of the most deep assets you can possibly create for your family. So if you're not currently growing, you know, a, a home garden, um, many of our regen farmers are realizing that they can actually create an additional revenue stream by just expanding that home garden to a couple acres and having a, a direct market garden uh, growing there again. And, and they for, had forgotten that they could have, you know, revenue coming in throughout the spring and summer while they were waiting for that big harvest check to come in in, in October now, they're now making money all, all season and they're growing pumpkins in the fall and they're doing it all right as far as that diversification of income. But at the same time, they're doubling down on human health in the home. Uh, they're starting to eat real homegrown tomatoes again, which have all these anti-cancer compounds and they're eating real kale and Brussels sprouts, getting in those cruciferous vegetables. They're getting sweet potatoes in there with those root vegetables, having all this interesting fiber with the beets and the turnips and the radishes, just life-giving force within the food that you're growing in that backyard. And so you, know, you cannot diminish or under you know state the importance of you know that that home production of, of your own food system again. So that's step one for human health. Bring that regenerative experience into the kitchen. Number two, you know, if you want additional support against glyphosate and all of that as you're making your transition and suffering under the consequences of a food system that's saturated with the chemical, this is a biased response now, but this is what our, our company's been working on for the last eight years, is how do we use uh, soil redox chemistry, much as you guys use it in soil inputs. We've learned to produce, you know, pharmaceutical grade compounds for human consumption and uh, we produce those in Virginia at our own state-of-the-art facility. We've really perfected the process of pulling these small carbon communication network molecules out of ancient humate. Uh, and so we've shown that to be very potent at reversing the damage done by glyphosate in human biology. It does it through supporting the intrinsic health of the body and its ability to repair itself once communication is restored. And so that product uh, has been on the market for the last seven years or so as, as the product Restore uh, recently rebranded over the last year to the product Ion Biome, which is a product line that includes Ion Gut for uh, human consumption, both for adults. There's a kid's product that has the FDA uh, dosing for uh, weight-based dosing for kids. Uh, there's also a pet product there that's got a different uh, mineral substrate in it for supporting feline and uh, health and uh, specifically to the kidney tubules that are so damaged in cats with the amount of Roundup they see in their food system. Uh, and then uh, for uh, health against the cancer consequences of glyphosate in dogs and the like. So we have an equine product coming out as well. So there's lots to be seen there and it's fascinating. And, and we've shown again and again in the lab and in human clinical trials, the impact. We're now in very large scale clinical trials with a, a pharmaceutical uh, product for cattle and poultry and swine in Canada. That product called LumaShield will be coming out in 2021, having a big effect on feed efficiency and, and uh, mortality in, in those uh, complex feed systems and protein industry. So there's lots that we do in that space and you know, resources that you can look into there. Um, it's it really fascinating to see that the microbial communication network of soil, both in the ground and in your gut, is responsible for your reservoir of, of healing potential in your body. And it's exciting to, to give that back. It's a simple uh, liquid uh, that you take a few times a day with meals uh, to bolster up and strengthen your response to a food system that's full of a lot of unfortunate components there. Thanks for developing and sharing that. Uh, I want to also focus in on the food conversation. There's this recurring theme in the regenerative agriculture space. Uh, and something that I'm particularly passionate about is the idea that we have the capacity to grow food as medicine. 
So I'd like to ask you from your perspective as a doctor, what does food need to be to be medicinal? Yeah, that's a great question. So there's a macronutrient answer to that, and that's fiber. So fiber is a critical, critical piece for medicine. The fiber acts as the coral reef, if you will, to the ecology of the human gut. And so fiber-rich foods uh, are critical to building that healthy ecosystem within the gut and with the extended organ system within the body to support bacteria, fungi, protozoa, and the like in that complex ecosystem that can generate fuel at every source. They can detox the system as, as needed, all of that life. So fiber, I think, is is a very overlooked you know, macronutrient that's critical to human health as a medicinal kind of quality to it. Then after that, you get into small molecules. Uh, the alkaloids get most of the attention here, but there's certainly many other flavonoids and, and uh, other uh, small molecules made within the plant systems uh, that have profound impact on human physiology, human biology, detoxification, all of that. And so the alkaloids, it turns out, are made through uh, the shikimate pathway largely as well. And so you end up disrupting that with glyphosate. And so by going to regenerative organic process, you start to give back the alkaloids back into the food system by increasing the amount of rich root vegetable intake. You're talking about things like, again, your daikon radish, your red radish, black radish, turnips, beets, potatoes, carrots, and the like, all of those are going to have a rich assay, if you will, of micronutrients coming out of that shikimate pathway with the alkaloid medicinals. And then when you go above soil, you get into the whole another class of alkaloids that are present in our cruciferous vegetables like Brussels sprouts, kale, and the like. Finally, as you go into the fruits, you see some profound compounds in there. Lycopene is a good example of one in tomatoes, for example, that has huge anti-cancer effects. The lycopene content of a tomato that's grown in in a hydroponic system and looks all red and pretty and an insect has never touched it actually has almost undetectable levels of of that lycopene cancer killer. And so we, we really need to not just grow food that looks pretty. We need to grow food that is nutrient and medicine dense again, if we're going to expect to see a reversal of this extinction event unfold. You didn't mention the biology that is associated with these various plants. Are those important for food to be medicinal as well to our own microbiome? The biology in which the plants are grown? The biology that is contained within and on the surfaces of those plants. Ah, yes. Yeah, that's a really cool concept. Yeah, so the microbiome, the bacteria, the fungi associated with the plants themselves Uh, seem to have an important relationship to your gut experience. And so I'm fascinated by the tomato as a good example of this. Again, uh, the tomato has these tiny hair-like particles that are over the surface. uh, Many of you have picked a tomato before and remember what that feels like, that that slight amount of, of just fuzziness that the tomato has. But as soon as you pick it and by the time you carry it into the house, it's now kind of starting to feel like that smooth potato. And the moment you rinse it, all of that is gone. Well, with that incredibly diverse hair-like follicles that cover the entire fruit, you've got this diverse microecosystem of bacteria, fungi, and the like. And if we look for a moment out into nature to learn something about that, we find out that all of the animals that graze are always going to be eating fruits and berries and the like off the plant and vegetables and the like. Well, they're not going to go eat the ones that have fallen off the plant already. Typically, you're, you're only going to see animals grazing on, on food that's out there in the living state, in the unpicked state. And I, I've taught a lot of my patients how to go back to that process and remember to at least take a bite of food every day that hasn't been picked, that is on the living plant, has the microbiome intact, to increase your gut microbiome intelligence as you engage with it. And so I'm always intrigued by the experience of biting into that tomato on the vine. Um, I invite you all to try this because it's a different experience than picking that and eating it a moment later. To feel that hair-like quality to the tomato, you know, that tiny little microscopic fuzz touch the tongue, you'll get a tingle out of that. You'll get an experience out of just that because that is a piece of the tomato that you've been missing in your diet since the beginning of of agriculture, really. really. So thinking about how do I get as close to the plant as possible is a very interesting new concept for nutrition. Zach, there are many questions that I'd love to ask you. We're only partially through the list that I put together, and I know we're running out of time, So there is, but there is one more question that I think is very important for us to talk about and I'd love to get your perspective on. You described how glyphosate and 
many of the associated compounds challenge the gut microbiome and challenge the gut lining and and how that is connected to suicide tendencies, suicidal tendencies and depression and so forth. And to me, this is a fascinating conversation because of the studying that I have already done about the neuro, various neurotransmitters and, and neural networks in our bodies. When you consider the neural network of the gut and the heart and the brain and how those are all connected by these neurotransmitters, one of the pieces that this ties together is an observation where we've observed that many very good growers who are very in tune with what is happening on their operation actively seek to develop their intuition. And they are very good at walking into a field and saying, something is going on. I'm not sure what's going on, but something is off with this block or something is off with this animal. They can't describe it intellectually. They're not, there may not be anything observable that they can point to visually, but they have this intuitive gut instinct of something not being well. So the question that I have for you is when we consider all of these different connections, what does it mean to be fully connected, fully human and fully spiritually present as a farmer? It's the most beautiful place that we could end. I, I just love the question. I love um, the deep insights and experience that would lead to a question like that. It's a beautiful thing that I think, you know, as you were speaking there, hearkened to one of my big heroes in the field, which is Charles Massey in, in Australia there. And I think his recent book, The Call of the Reed Warbler, is a book of poetry as much as it is a document of regenerative force and capacity of a farm. And I think he captures in that first couple of paragraphs, pages of the book, that transition for him, where he went from an exhausted commodities crop kind of producer and had lost all sense of spiritual connection to his land to this incredible reawakening of that connection and a reawakening of the sense of beauty and love for his land. And I, I feel like that is just a a real testimony, I think, to what we're being called here to this planet to do as human beings, which is to be in a co-creative process with Mother Nature herself. It's almost uh, terrifying that we forgot we, we were here to create. We have come here as such a consumptive and destructive Western civilization that we forgot that we are really called to receive from Mother Earth rather than to take from her. And she wants to give bountifully to all of her children, you know, this sense of just a real joy for watching new species of or ancient species of birds returning to your land when you start to allow crop diversification and cover crops to come back in and wildflowers to grow on the edges of your farm again and the likes. It's, it's just a real reminder to us that we're here to be recipients and co-creators for a, a healthier and more beautiful future. Uh, I think it's interesting that humans showed up. We showed up 200,000 years ago, if the fossil record's accurate. And uh, so 200,000 years in a planet that's four and a half billion years old. And so imagine the beauty that existed so far before our experience here. Imagine the beauty that preceded the last great extinction of the dinosaurs and all of that. Uh, there were ferns that were the size of houses. There was, you know, uh, just a vibrant, nutrient-dense forests and everything else that allowed life to thrive as it did at that time. We've never seen the return of reptiles at that scale because we don't have nutrient density to allow for that, that scale of life to return yet. And so in our human experience, we don't even know how beautiful this planet could get. But I think you get it in, the, in moments of sense of the sun rising and the mist rising from uh, Charles Farm there, and you've got you know the birds singing, and you know the the pond system starting to do the hydraulic cycle again, and you've got just this the multi tiered beauty to the whole system. I see that very thing in, in those farm events that are are regenerative in their purpose, where you see people in tears, often hugging, and so glad to see each other, and telling beautiful stories of what's happening because they're feeling not just an improvement in economic security. They're feeling an improvement in self-identity. They have a deep-rooted sense of this is who I am as a farmer. I am here to co-create and be witness to Mother Nature doing her very best rather than constantly fighting Mother Nature in all that she does. And so it's just 
a real deep question that you asked there. And I'm sure that you are closer to the experience of that than I can be. And I, I can only imagine what a joy your journey has been in this last you know 15 years from your kind of, I think it was around 2006 that you made your big switch and and opened your eyes to this whole new world and what a journey you've been on. And so I would love to just hear for a moment what that spiritual awakening has been for you and and how that's affected not just you, but probably your family and generations to come uh, that are learning from you. Well, I would echo your comments that ultimately, I believe what we as humans, what we as people really desire is we desire connection. We desire to see and to be seen and to be accepted. And, and I think, of course, growing up in an Amish community from a very much from a Judeo-Christian worldview perspective, I've very much come to appreciate the different parts of the scripture that talk about co-creation. And ultimately, if we believe that, if we truly believe that we are the sons and daughters of God, then that the extension of that, uh, I believe that creation is not something that happened just at one moment in time in the beginning but it's something that happens new every day. Every day is a new creation. Each moment is a new creation. And as the sons and daughters of God, as co-creators, it is our gift, our opportunity, and our responsibility to co-create the reality that we desire to see here on earth. And when I say co-create, I'm speaking of co-creation with God, but also co-creation with the all the other living organisms, the plants, the animals, and everything that we are surrounded with that he has put here on this earth for us. We can co-create Eden on earth with the knowledge and the wisdom that we already have that he has given us. We simply need to stop abusing the system. Yeah, that's beautifully said. That is beautifully said. I, you know, in the end, you know, as a physician and as, you know, somebody that's increasingly around farmers, I find that life is so eloquent in its simplicity in the end, which is life on earth is always marching towards more biodiversity and more cooperative creation. And so it's what you just described there is, is really the nature of life itself. It always wants more diversity and it always wants more abundance from that diversity's cooperative relationship and, and efforts. And I'm so excited for the potential that successful transition to a global regenerative agricultural system would then lay the foundation for a regenerative economy, for a regenerative transportation and energy sector, for a regenerative socioeconomic and political system. We should realize that whether it be spiritual diversity or and religious diversity views or political diversity, it's going to give life when we embrace the diversity for it rather than fight against uh, those that we see different from ourselves. And so in the same way that we have turned our warlike mentality against Mother Earth and, and her microbes. We are turning our, our warlike mentality against one another, and we need to see the end of that if we frankly deserve to survive uh, past this pending extinction crisis that we're in. If we're going to survive, we need a new relationship that loses that warlike mentality. Ultimately, there is no me and you. There is just me and another aspect of me. When we truly consider and embrace the idea that all of us are connected and all of us are one, then that gives us a whole new respect and appreciation for everything that is creation. It's beautiful. I, I, I think that's one of the reasons I love hanging out with you, John, is because I, <laughs> in that sense of singularity, in that sense of we are, we are one. <laughs> I get so tired of listening to my own voice. I get so tired of hearing myself. And then when I hear you say things, I'm like, I think I might have said that recently, but it sure sounds better coming out of your head. <laughs> and so I'm just so relieved to like have that sense of like consciousness is something that we're all tapping into now. And we always have. And I think we are being called or given the opportunity to tap into this awareness of life, this awareness of biology and experience this you know, singularity of knowledge and wisdom and intuition, as you so wisely described it earlier. Uh, farmers have always been among our best observers, and uh, we, we stole that away from them. And I think physicians, I've got the blessing of having a bunch of the journals uh, from my, my great, great 
three greats, great, great, great grandfather, um, who was a physician in the 1800s. And he uh, kept these exquisite medical journals. And I see in them the same observational power that made him a great physician when there was an era of no CT scans and no x-rays and no antibiotics. He was able to diagnose things that we still struggle to diagnose today. And he know, knew them by name. He he, he knew exactly what the pathogens were. He knew w- what elements needed to bring that back into balance from an herbal concoction, like just an extraordinary depth of wisdom and intuition in that human being. And he trusted his own diagnostic skills uh, that were guided by his own deep sense of intuition that mimic those that you just described with the farmer that walked into the field and says, hold on, something's not right. Let me listen carefully here. And John, I'm so looking forward to working with your whole group in more depth and, and more projects together. It's just a very exciting time when we see physicians, scientists, economists, and farmers all coming together to envision this new world uh, that desperately needs to be built. And so I can't wait to be co-creating that with your whole team. I want to thank you for sharing your wisdom, your thoughts, and uh, I'm sure we're going to have many enjoyable and in-depth conversations coming up. The team at AEA and I are dedicated to bringing this show to you because we believe that knowledge and information is the foundation of successful regenerative systems. At AEA, we believe that growing better quality food and making more money from your crops is possible. And since 2006, we've worked with leading professional growers to help them do just that. At AEA, we don't guess, we test, we analyze, and we provide recommendations based on scientific data knowledge, and experience. We've developed products that are uniquely positioned to help growers make more money with regenerative agriculture. If you are a professional grower who believes in testing instead of guessing, someone who believes in a better, more regenerative way to grow, visit advancingecoag.com and contact us to see if AEA is right for you. Thank you for listening, and we look forward to working with you.